Greetings and Shalom Havarim. Peace to you my friends. My name is Ron Smith and uh, good to be with you once again in this particular week. The week that we are talking about a wonderful parasha, a wonderful portion of the Bible. It is in Exodus chapter 18 verse 1 all the way through chapter 20 and today we're going to talk about chapter 20. And this is what we otherwise call the Ten Commandments. And we will take a look at this. And yesterday, I, uh, I voiced this particular um, idea, or, or just caught this particular thing I want to remind you of. And it is simply this. That one of the, the two pieces of scripture in Isaiah that follows this portion, and I understand, it is Orthodox Rabbinic uh, Judaism that prescribed this particular scripture to follow this portion and that is Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 which says unto us a son is given a son and his, uh, a son is born dominion will rest on his shoulders and he will be given the name Pele Yoetz El Gibor Aviatz Shalom miraculous counselor mighty God father of eternity prince of peace in order to extend the dominion and perpetuate the peace of the throne of King David there are the throne and kingdom of David to secure it and sustain it through justice and righteousness henceforth forever. The zeal of Adonai Tzavot will accomplish this. Now, I ask the question, why does that scripture follow the portion that we're reading about here in Exodus? And again, I will repeat this a few times. That was put there by Orthodox Judaism, okay? by those rabbis, the sages of old. Well, um, let's go into this. Let's look at it. Exodus chapter 19, verse 25, the last verse of Exodus 19 says, in Hebrew it says, Vayered Moshe el ha'am, vayomer elihem. Translated means, and Moses went down to the people and said to them, the very next line says, Vayedber Elohim et kol ha'devarim ha'ele lemor. And God spoke all these words and said. Okay. Two lines that sound exactly the like. Exactly like, just very, very little difference. Here is Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. By Targum Ankylos. Targum Ankylos is the person that we otherwise call Aquila in the New Testament. Okay. And this is Targum Ankylos, the Jerusalem version. Quote. And the word of the Lord, and the word, word is capitalized, capital, W-O-R-D. And the word of the Lord spake all the excellency of these words. Okay, again, the, the words, the Hebrew words of Exodus 20 verse 1 says, Vaya deber, deber or devar means the word, the word of Elohim, the word of God. Et kod hadevrim, spoke all of these words. So, Targum Ankylos, Targum is a paraphrase, but it's not that distance of a paraphrase here. You can see the word, capital W, capital w O R D, the word of the Lord spoke all the excellency of these words. So, again, I'm just reading my notes now. I said that we would mention just why Yeshiahu or Isaiah. Chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, follows the reading of this particular parasha, parasha Yitro, or the portion called Jethro, in Orthodox Judaism. In the above reading, Moses and the Lord appear to be speaking at the same time. Do we, do we remember what the Lord told Moses concerning the coming prophet who would be just like him? He said, I will send a prophet just like you. And he said that to Moses. Following the text, the paraphrase or Targum of Ankylos, the biblical Aquila, says that it was the Word who spoke the all-important principles which we are about to review. It was through the eternal Word that the multiverse was created, per Genesis chapter 1. And, by the way, Colossians chapter 1 also agrees with that. Verse 14 of that chapter goes on to tell us that the eternal word took on corporeality. Corpor corporeality 
is that he incorporated himself among us. He became flesh. And he was sukkoted or tabernacled among us. Now, I will remind you again that it was Orthodox Rabbinic Judaism that intended to follow this portion that we're reading with the prophetic reading of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, as well as Isaiah 6, verse 1 through chapter 7, verse 6. Okay? So, there you have it. This is why a son, unto us a son is given, or unto us a son is born, unto us a son is given, and so forth, follows chapter 20 of Exodus, because it was the eternal word who spoke these words. Okay. I guess I'll stop repeating myself. Word number one. Now, these are called, in Hebrew, these are called the Ten Words. They will later, later on be called the Ten Commandments within the Bible, but their presentation, when they're being presented, they're called the Ten Words, or that is, we may, we may say, the Ten Principles. These are broad principles that all the rest of the Torah is based upon. In other words, these Ten Principles are the foundation for the rest of Torah, just as Torah is the foundation for the rest of the Bible, and the Bible becomes Torah itself. So, number one, I am Adonai your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. So he says, I am Yodevave, I am Adonai your God, I am the Lord your God. Our God is this person. He is a person, okay? He is the only one who may be designated as our Savior. And many times it says in the Bible that He is our Savior. Many times. But I will go, I just referenced actually Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11. I'm turning there now. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11 says, and this is God speaking. I, yes, I am Adonai. Beside me, there is no Savior. Okay? There is no one that we can call Savior from, from our sins aside from this God. Okay? Anytime you refer to Jesus as Savior, you are referencing the God of the whole Bible. Okay? If you call him Savior, and he is not the God of the whole Bible, you're committing blasphemy. You're committing idolatry. But if you acknowledge who he is and who he said he is, well, you understand. He is our Savior. Word number two, principle number two in Hebrew says, Lo yehyeh leka Elohim acharim apanaiv. I'm going to translate that. Do not have any of your past gods in my face or in my presence. Lo, do not, Yehyeh have, Lika for yourself, Elohim gods, Acharim, in the past, Al Panaev, in my face, or in my presence. Our God, or our husband, is, quote, a jealous God. It says so in this particular word. Don't have any gods or addictions of any kind at all. You read the whole thing. Let me go ahead and read the whole thing. You are not to make for yourselves a carved image or, of, or any kind of representation of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the water below the shoreline. You are not to bow down to them or serve them. I, for I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for, their, for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but displaying grace to the thousandth generation of those who love me and obey my mitzvot, obey my commands. So, what he's saying there, you know, don't have any, and I'm, I'm translating the word gods as addictions, okay? Let's just go ahead and get right down to it. He allows the children to experience the sins of their parents up to the fourth generation, but gives grace to thousands. And the word generation there is not in the text. He gives grace to thousands upon thousands of people who love him and obey his commands. Okay? He is to be our only God. No addictions aside from him. Okay? Word number three, principle number three. <coughs> Do not take his name without living like it. Okay, that's my own translation. Do not take his name without living like it. To take a man's name is to be married to him. Okay? 
To take the Lord's name in vain is to be called one of his people, but betraying his person. Okay? It's not about whether or not you say his name correctly. It's not about whether or not you cuss. It's not about any of those things. When you take a name, that means you're being married to that person. In fact, this whole situation here on Mount Sinai is a wedding proposal. We've already talked about that as well. Okay? So, our Lord is offering himself to be our husband and we, his wife, his segula, his treasure. So, when we take his name, we are to act like it. Okay? Don't take his name and live as if you're a whore. Can I say it that way? Okay. The Lord does not leave that sort of individual unpunished. All right? Word number four, and this is just a review, okay? I'm not getting terribly detailed here. Just a review. Word number four, zakor. Zakor, remember. Let me read the whole thing. Remember the day, Shabbat, to set it apart for God. You have six days to labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Shabbat for Adonai, your God. On it, you are not to do any kind of work. Not you, your son, your daughter, your, your male or female slave, nor your livestock, nor your for the foreigner stand with you inside the gates to your property. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the, the sea and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. This is why Adonai blessed the day Shabbat and separated it for himself. Let's review this. The reason for two candles lit on every Shabbat, Friday night. Uh, if you are listening to me and you don't know these customs, then I'll explain. Two candles are usually lit on Friday night. Friday night is what begins the Sabbath day. Throughout the Bible, a day begins in darkness. A day begins in the evening prior. The reason for that are the two different versions of this particular principle. Zakur is mentioned here, and Shamar, or Shomer, uh, Shamor, pardon me, Shomor, or guard, is the way it puts it in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 12. Okay, so two candles. One means that we, we light them to remember the Sabbath day, and the other one we light to guard the Sabbath day. In Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 through 17, this is called Vishamru, we are told to both guard and to do. It says Vishamru. And then it says then Asa. Then Asa means to do. We do Yom HaShabbat. We do the Sabbath day. Six days are given to us to do all of our going out work. Our going out kind of work is Malaka. Malaka there in the Hebrew text means to walk out, to go out. That's when you drive down the road to do your job. And it's, it's that as well as hard labor. The word labor there is, you know, when we say labor nowadays, what we mean is hard labor. But God blessed the seventh day. In fact, he, in, in Exodus 30, uh, 31, there in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the text, is, <laughs> it says the last bit of that text, the last bit of verse 17 says, Vayinafash. Vayinafash means he ensouled day number seven. He put his soul into that day, his nephesh, his soul. So that is how he blessed, he says he blessed that day. He finished that day according to uh, Genesis chapter 2. He finished his work on that day. He finished it by putting his soul into it, his person therein. So the way we do the seventh day, you know, it says both to guard and to do. How do we do the seventh day? Well, it's actually the same way we do Sunday. We congregate, worship the Lord, and hear from his eternal word. The seventh day was not changed, quote-unquote changed, until the Council of Laodicea in the latter part of the 4th century. In fact, in the Council of Laodicea, three eternal curses, anathemas, were put on anyone who did not rest and congregate on Sunday as well as work on Saturday. If you were caught resting on Saturday but you congregated on Sunday, you were eternally cursed. If you were caught um, working on Sunday but resting and congregating on Saturday, you were eternally cursed. They wanted to make sure that you understood that they were changing it and they thought that they had the authority to change it. I do not believe they have the authority to change that. But that's me. <laughs> so, 
I, you know, fourth, late 4th century, I think, is way too late. Anyway, Hebrews chapter 4, speaking of the seventh day, says, quote, So there remains a shab Shabbat keeping, Sabbatismo is the Greek word there, means Shabbat keeping. So there remains a Shabbat keeping, a Shabbat guarding for God's people. Okay, Speaking of the seventh day, it was not changed. Christians did not gather on Sunday until Rome made them do it. I am not Roman. In fact, you might even call me a Protestant. Let's look at word number five. The fifth principle says, Kaved, honor, glorify mom and dad. Okay? Honor mom and dad. It says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land, which Adonai your God has given you. Honor and respect are not separate ideas in Hebrew. Not not like they are in English. In English, we would speak of respect, literally means to look back, and we would speak of honor as something different. In Hebrew, they're the same thing. Okay. Now, I point this out simply because I'm reading to you the Holy Bible, not any man or woman's feelings. Okay. I'm not reading to you from an English text. I'm reading to you from the ancient Hebrew text. And if it's going to be the Bible, I'm going to read to you that text because it's important to me. It's important to you if you want to follow the Bible. Now, we can go ahead and argue whether or not respect and honor are the same thing in English. But guess what? English is a relatively new language. Okay? Therefore, it does not matter. All right? So... Respect, honor your parents. It's really simple. Honor and respect extend even to anyone with gray hair. When these commandments are repeated in Leviticus chapter 19, and they are repeated there, it will tell us to rise from our seats when someone with gray hair walks in. Now, with gray hair, it doesn't say when an old person walks in. There may be somebody with a completely gray head at the age of 17. I've met people. I went to school with someone who turned entirely gray when he was 18. But that is not about age. That is about what a person is going through, what a person has suffered, what a person uh, has gained in life. It might also have to do with your, your genes, you know. Not your pants, but your, you know, genes. G-E-N-E-S. <laughs> but I just want to get across this particular, um, this particular principle of honor and respect. It's a very important thing. It's a bedrock of any decent society. Okay. Do you wish, in fact, to keep living in the land which our God has given you? Let's move on to principle number six. Principle number six simply says, Lo Titzak. Lo Titzak simply means no murder. Okay, don't do it. No murder. Just get it out of your mind. Principle number seven. Low enough. No adultery. Don't do it. Get it out of your mind, out of your heart, out of your spirit, out of your person. Okay? No adultery. You might be a grown up, but you don't have to be an adult and commit adultery. Okay? Principle number eight. Low enough. Low enough means no theft. Okay? Cut it out. No theft. Don't do it. All right? Stop it. All this rioting and looting? No, don't do it. This is, these are principles that the bedrock of society is in these ten principles. If you can't abide by these ten principles, then you lose this thing called society. And all we, we turn into animals. Okay? Bedrock principle number nine. Lota ane bereach ed shakir. No lying answer is to be given to your neighbor as, as you're witnessing. Don't commit perjury. Now, we will point out, yes, this particular uh, principle is within the context of the courtroom. Yes, it is. However, let me also point out, because nowadays we will have scuffles around about this. The word in the Hebrew text, shaker, means to lie. So one group will say, well, this is a courtroom perjury issue. And another person will say, well, we should never lie. 
you're both right okay <laughs> it's not it's in a courtroom procedure but that doesn't mean you can walk out of the courtroom and then you know get away with anything no of course not that's for groups of people whose mind is always in the courtroom but we need not perjure ourselves in any kind of condition so you know don't lie all right keep your yes yes and your no no and go forward yeah, certainly don't put your neighbor in a bad position by means of perjury. Principle number 10. All of this being a quick review. Lo takmod. That is, don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. Now, the word rendered as covet means to be greedy, to, to lust for. Kamod. It means to be greedy, lust for, to desire. We need not separate these words as we read this text. Now, in English, we might say greedy and lust and desire are three different things. And in English, maybe they are. But in Hebrew, it's all the same. Okay? And again, I am reading to you from the Bible, from the Holy Bible. I'm reading to you from the actual text. I'm not trying to argue English. All right? English is too young. Okay, so, we are not to be greedy toward or lustful for or covet, quote, anything that belongs to your neighbor. Anything. Anything. We saw the word hamod, meaning greed, lust, or desire. We saw it for the first time in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when Hava, or Eve, lusted after the tree and its fruit. She saw that it was desirable, hamod. It was, is, had a lusting ability about it and that it was good for food. It was eye candy. Okay. So due to the language, I referred to that whole scene there as a nakedness contest. You know, the last verse of chapter 2 says that the snake was crafty. The word there means naked. And it opened, he was more crafty than any other animal, any other beast. He was more naked than anything else. Then he comes to Adam and Eve and challenges their nakedness. And he presents eye candy in front of them. So, understand, this is the same thing. This coveting, this lust, this desire is the same thing that was proposed to Adam and Eve by the snake, by the serpent in the garden. Okay, don't go there. Just, just don't do it. So, let's read on. Just a really quick view there of the ten words, the ten commandments. And then I want to read on through chapter 20 for you. It says, All the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they trembled. Standing at a distance, they said to Moshe, You speak with us, and we will listen. But don't let God speak with us, or we'll die. Moshe answered the people, Don't be afraid, because God has come only to test you and to make you fear him, so that you won't commit sins. So the people stood at a distance, but Moshe approached the thick darkness where God was. Yeah, I'm going to translate this for you. Now, this is my translation. That's David Stern's translation, and he's actually rather close. And I'm not trying to be anything here. Uh, we all try to make this readable, but here I'm not trying to make it readable so much as I'm trying to explain it. Quote, All the people saw the voices, kolot, voices, the flames, lapidim, the voice of the shofar, kol shofar, and the mountain smoking. When they saw, they moved and stood at a distance. They said to Moshe, You daber, you be the word, you speak with us, and we will listen. Don't let God speak with us, lest we die. Moshe said to the people, Do not fear, because in this time God has come to test you, and in this time his awe or fear may be on your faces so that you won't sin. So the people stood at a distance as Moshe approached or Moshe touched. The word it, it literally means touched. The people stood at a distance as Moshe touched the thick darkness where God was. I believe, if you listen to this, that you will find a similar experience as recorded in for this particular same holy day called Shavuot or Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2. Here we read again. All the people saw the voices, the tongues, 
Okay. You know, the shofar blowing louder and louder, what does that require? Lots of wind. Wind, air, spirit, it's all the same word in Hebrew. The spirit blew. They saw tongues. They saw the voices. The flames. Ah, uh, yeah. Voices as flames. The voice of the shofar as it grew louder in the mountain smoking. Read it again there in Acts chapter 2 as well. Same holiday. Same holy day. Let's read a little bit further. Wonderful stuff. I just want to show you that the holy days don't change. Exodus chapter 20, verses 22 through 26, the rest of the chapter. Adonai said to Moshe, Here is what you are to say to the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen that I spoke with you from heaven. You are not to make with me gods of silver, nor are you to make gods of gold for yourselves. For me, you may make only an altar of earth on it, you will sacrifice your burnt offerings, peace offerings, sheep, goats, and cattle. In every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. If you do make me an altar of stone, you're not to build it of cut stones. For, it, for if you use a tool on it, you profane it. Likewise, you are not to use steps to go up to my altar so that you won't be indecently uncovered. Well, you see, Adonai repeats the first injunction against idolatry. Then he invites his people to offer to him. The word for an offering in Hebrew is based on the verb for coming near, kariv. Karav, the verb, means to come near. Korban is an offering. The same, the same consonants, just different vowels. In bringing gifts to the Lord, to Adonai, and to his people, the Lord also provides to come near to them. An altar, that's the Latin word from the Latin Vulgate, a grilling place, need not have steps, which could expose nakedness when climbing, or be used for such. And ancients were lewd people, so the Lord doesn't want them to, his people to be lewd. A simple mound of dirt will suffice for a grilling area. It is of, if it is of stone, it's to be of uncut stone. Sages have pointed out that a tool is also a weapon. Okay, same thing. A weapon of warfare. And thus, the imagery that is sought to be put out here is an imagery of peace. That is a piece that is meant to be preserved when we come together in his presence. Okay, When we come to him, he comes to us and he meets us there. And we dwell in his presence. That should be a peaceful place. That's the imagery, imagery that uh, the sages believed was, uh, was sought after here. And I agree with them. Paul points out that we would not, that he would not know what sin, or specifically greed, is, had not Torah said, Thou shalt not covet. Indeed, he says, quote, Torah is holy, that is, the commandment is holy, just and good. It is the sin nature within us, that acting as a replacement Torah, that draws us to sin when we encounter the command within the pages of Torah. The command itself is holy, just, and good. But when that sin nature sees that command, it rebels. It wants to act out a rebellion, and that sin nature, therefore, steps up as a replacement Torah. That is called sin. We will read about that later on in Leviticus. So, that Torah that acts out, that springs out of us and surges out of us wanting to rebel, is what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7. It's a slippery slope that he describes. He wants to do good, but he finds himself doing otherwise, the flesh of himself doing otherwise. Sin would have nothing to fight against if it were not for, if it were not for God's eternal word. It would have nothing to fight against. That eternal word that's either written or made flesh. When we are confronted with the eternal word of God, Either the word, capital W, that is written down like we just noted, or that word, capital W, that's made flesh. It's the same word. 
But when we encounter that and we feel something in us want to rebel, note that's a replacement Torah going on in us and we need to shut it down. How, would, how do we do that? Well, Paul's remedy and ours is found in God's Spirit, Romans chapter 8. God's Spirit authored the Torah, breathed into us. When he breathes that into us, when he breathes his Spirit into us, he's also breathing his Torah into us. Remember, the renewed covenant says that he will write the Torah on our hearts. How does he do that? By breathing into us the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit authored that book, authored that document, authored the Word of God. So, walking in God's presence, that meaning walking in His Spirit, directs us and strengthens us to walk in His ways, the eternal ways of Torah. Thus, we will not be under or outside of, and certainly not above God and His eternal ways, but in namas ter Christus. In namas, in namas Christus means in Torah as, as upheld by Messiah. In Christ and in his eternal word, we can overcome. Now, I was referring there to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul notes that he himself is not under Torah, he himself is not outside of Torah, and there's no mention of being above Torah or above God. But he says, in Greek, he says that he is en nomos Christus, in the Torah as, as upheld by Messiah. So, that is the position, that is how we are to relate to this holy book. This holy word that is given to us here in the chapter we just read, Exodus chapter 20. Okay. I just wanted to review it, but I also wanted to remind us of how we are able to walk that out, how we are able to live it. If you are an unbeliever and you find that you cannot live out the Ten Commandments, that you find yourself stealing and looting, that you find yourself throwing a fit, that you find yourself throwing a temper tantrum as an older gentleman or lady, but acting more like a five-year-old child. I want to invite you to call upon the name of the Lord, call upon the name of the God of Israel, and beseech him for his saving grace, and beg him, ask him for his Holy Spirit to, to come into you and take you over. He alone needs to be our addiction. Okay, No other God is going to satisfy no other God is going to be able to fill that hole and keep you from acting like a five-year-old baby, okay? You are a beautiful person, and you can be and act like that beautiful person in God's Spirit. Amen? Amen? Shalom, my friends. And as we look forward to Shabbat, I read about it in the fourth principle. As we look forward to Shabbat on Friday night through Saturday night, I bid you Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Umivarak. May you have a peaceful Sabbath, and may you be blessed.